Hi everyone, my name is Kevin Garcia. I'm a first year MSW MPH student at the Colorado State University working as a graduate research assistant with Dr. Shannon Hughes. I also have a bachelor's in psychology from the Florida International University and a bachelor's in biology from the Metropolitan State University of Denver. My interests are broad, but overall I'm most interested in psychedelics, harm reduction, trauma, and substance use. I work in harm reduction spaces as a harm reduction content expert for Next Distro, and will be starting the second portion of a tobacco harm reduction writing fellowship for Fitz or Mag in the next two months. I'm passionate about destigmatizing all kinds of substance use, social justice, and drug policy reform. My goal is to stay involved with harm reduction and pursue a PhD to become involved in psychedelic therapy research. And my psychedelics talk today is about PCP-assisted psychotherapy and the potential clinical uses of PCP, ketamine analogs, and PCP analogs. This class of drugs is also called aerocyclohexylamines, dissociative drugs, or dissociative anesthetics. And so when you think of PCP, what do you think of? And I'll let you sit with that for a few moments. And what most people think of is that PCP will inevitably lead to psychosis, death, or other serious issues. However, this is far from the truth. And so why don't we think of this? The war on drugs and its associated propaganda, the resulting long-lasting stigma associated with PCP, and psychedelic exceptionalism are among a few reasons for the continued negative social perceptions of PCP and the people who use it. So here's a quote from Dr. Carl Hart. I'll give you a moment to read that. And uh, in this uh, Filter Mag article, Dr. Hart also highlighted the tragic cases of Laquan McDonald, Rodney King, and Terrence Crutcher. These were all black men who were either killed or beaten by police who claimed their victims were behaving violently after being intoxicated by PCP. And it's important to highlight that PCP has historically been used to police communities of color. And this is a quote from a 1991 LA Times article from attorney Carl Watson. And uh, attorney Carl Watson also mentioned in the article that when PCP was more popular, it was relatively common for police to use PCP as a justification for their excessive force in making arrests. So similar to cannabis, for many years, PCP was used as an excuse for violence and prosecution of marginalized communities, and it still happens today. And so this is the highlight of the psychedelics talk, PCP and related analogs have the potential for clinical use. And there is no recent research on PCP or analogs in humans in a clinical context. So we'll spend some time discussing the results from studies from the 1950s to the 1960s on PCP. And as a note, aerocyclohexylamines are the class of drugs that encompass PCP and ketamine. And so why was PCP left behind? Most studies use retrospective data collection, they lacked appropriate comparison groups, and had other flaws that made it impossible to distinguish actual PCP effects from pre-existing conditions or other factors like substance use or head injury. Before 1970, there were thousands of patients who used PCP and violence was never reported. And so assumptions about PCP and violence are not warranted. Similar to LSD, PCP was once thought to be a psychomimetic drug, or a drug that causes a state of psychosis. And due to the negative side effects occurring at anesthetic doses, ketamine was preferred over PCP for that specific purpose, and PCP was, abandonedly, was effectively abandoned for ketamine. And although there was clinical studies using PCP, they were halted when the war on drugs started, and this is similar to what occurred with psychedelic research. So uh, Dr. Jason Wallach is one of the most prominent experts on aerocyclohexylamine research and has investigated dozens of ketamine and PCP analogs. This is a quote from them. 
I completely agree with Dr. Wallace that uh, the stigma around PCP is almost exclusively of the media's creation and, of course, uh, the propaganda due to the war on drugs. So Cerno or CI-395 is what they used to call PCP or fencyclidine. And so in this study, PCP was used for anesthetic purposes. And as researchers would soon find out, PCP is not effective for anesthesia due to its behavioral effects at these astronomically high doses. It's no wonder that there was excitation unrelated to the surgical procedure. According to Arrowhead, 10 milligrams is considered to be a strong dose. Additionally, the study is referring to the IV use of PCP, which has a much higher bioavailability compared to the oral PCP. And injecting a drug roughly doubles the effect of an oral dose of a drug. And so this really tells you how very high the doses in this study were for uh, for PCP. Uh, a 10 milligram doses, patients responded weekly and some of them were in ecstatic trances. Some of the patients repeatedly whispered words such as heavenly, beautiful, or lovely, and two of the participants believed that they were in the presence of God. Of course, at 20 milligrams, folks were unresponsive for up to 1.5 hours, and clearly, this is not what the researchers were looking for in an anesthetic drug, and this speaks to PCP's eventual abandonment for ketamine, which has little to no stimulating effects and is a more appropriate drug for anesthetic purposes. And so the most important finding of this study is that according to the authors, the improvement was due to the combination of PCP and psychotherapy. Importantly, the dose used was also much lower than the dose used for anesthesia. As you can see, it's about 3.5 to 4.5 milligrams, much lower than for anesthetic purposes. And so this 1961 study involved psychotherapy and PCP in five patients. PCP in a therapeutic context facilitated talking and expression of early memory similar to MDMA in a therapeutic context. And, uh, the word aberration means that there is an expression and release of previously repressed emotions or memories. And there is also some symptom improvements, but this should be taken with a grain of salt due to the lack of scientific rigor seen in these older studies. So this 1963 study involved psychotherapy and PCP in patients with mental health issues. The results were similar to the previous studies and the highlights are that the participants experience expression of rep repressed material, significant episodes in the past were remembered, and feelings of bodily change were followed by a description of childhood fantasies. And although this data is outdated and needs to be revisited, the effects of PCP in a therapeutic context should certainly be investigated further. These are all qualities that make PCP a, a great potential adjunct to psychotherapy. Additionally, if there is any interest in PCP, specific analogs can be designed that may last less time or be less visual or have other qualities that may be useful for psychotherapy. And not to mention there is already a ton of uh, ketamine and PCP analogs that exist. There just needs to be further investigation to uh, highlight their potential uses. So is PCP associated with psychosis? Is it, is it common? So dose plus setting plus set equals effect. So a 1960 study found that the combination of sensory deprivation and PCP resulted in a calmer experience Patients felt more in control and experienced a state of utter nothingness or emptiness. And this speaks to PCP sensitivity to set and setting, just like any drug, particularly psychedelic drugs. And psychosis may occur with anesthetic or higher doses of PCP, but this also occurs with psychedelics or stimulants. At a high dose, it might cause psychosis in some folks, especially those who are predisposed to psychosis. But the claims of super strength, violence, or criminal behavior associated with PCP are definitely false. And uh, early PCP research parallels early LSD research. They're both deemed to be psychomimetic drugs or drugs that cause psychosis. And of course, this was false with LSD, and I believe that's also the case with uh, PCP. At anesthetic doses, overstimulation is bound to occur, and this is a large reason why PCP was abandoned. 
different mechanisms, similar experiences. So here are some experts or excerpts from a 1978 study. And so it's obvious that uh, in terms of effects, there are clear similarities between PCP and psychedelics. And I like that this individual said, uh, you know, not nearly as trippy as other psychedelics, but it was clearly a psychedelic. And I think that's a good quality for, uh, you know, uh, drugs used for psychotherapy. And I also found it interesting that the researchers also stated that most of the drug using youths with whom they had contact with were not dulled or depressive as described in the literature and the media. Rather, they are bright, level-headed, and stable, and eager, and willing to experience life, including drugs that are part of that life. So it's interesting that uh, the researchers said this, and it went contrary to a lot of the uh, information associated with PCP users at the time and currently. So these are some common effects in this entire class of drugs of aerocyclohexamines, dissociative drugs, or dissociative anesthetics whatever you like to call them, but, uh, you know, it means the same thing. And of course, these effects may vary with dose, but for the most part, more stimulating effects occur in lower doses, while more sedating effects may occur in higher doses, hence why it was once used for anesthesia at the very high doses. And the hallucinogenic effects occur at varying degrees at all doses, quite similar to uh, other psychedelic drugs. And so ketamine is a PCP analog, methoxidamine or MXC is a ketamine analog, 3-MeO PCE is a PCP analog. But overall, I like to think of these analogs as cousins. They are structurally similar and they are likely similar in effect, but differ in certain respects. Of course, the research on these compounds is quite limited on humans, but researchers have uh, elucidated their behavioral effects and we know that their effects are pretty similar across the uh you know all these uh, all these substances so being with the buddha a case report of methoxidamine use in a united states veteran with ptsd and so this image describes a theoretical mechanism for the action of mxc so mxc resulted in more spiritual feelings which is why the person chose it over ketamine and the authors theorize that MXC's serotonergic action may mitigate anxiety and dysphoria due to chronic activation of the HPA axis, and this is seen in many mental health disorders. And so the results of the study suggest that MXC is more similar in effect and mechanism to PCP analogs than to ketamine. So ketamine works mostly through NMDA antagonism, but as you can see, methoxidamine also has the serotonergic action. And according to scientific literature, a lot of the PCP analogs also have this uh, serotonergic action and other mechanisms that make them a bit different from uh, ketamine. But still, it's similar effects overall. And so scientific research, as I mentioned previously, has characterized and studied dozens of aerocyclohexylamines. However, more research is needed to explore the therapeutic values. And in the study from the last slide, the veteran preferred MXC over ketamine due to its spiritual and calm inducing feelings. And so it's possible that PCP analogs, including 4-MeO-PCP, 3-MeO-PCP, 3-MeO-PCE, and others, or ketamine analogs such as MXC, may be more efficacious than ketamine for therapeutic purposes due to their activity on the serotonin transporter, or due to an, another unknown mechanism that you know we, we just don't know about yet and their stimulating properties may also be helpful for talk therapy similar to mdma however the only information involving human use of these novel compounds is anecdotal and alongside analysis of qualitative information readily available on the internet due to the recreational use of aerocyclohexylamines you know, uh, there's a lot of information out there and we need more human clinical research on the topic. And so here are a few anecdotes I found from the subreddit dissociatives on the website Reddit. I like these quotes because they speak to the potential medical uses of PCP analogs, but also hints at the misuse potential, which is common with ketamine, for example.
it's definitely you know there's mention of a uh, eviscerating depression and just as a note 3 hopcp is another pcp analog you know they also cite changes that led to my personal development you know revolutionary insights and then I like the last bit because it mentioned the, uh, you know, you need a lot of discipline for medical application. And I think that's hinting at the, uh, you know, the misuse potential. And of course, there are countless anecdotes, both positive and negative, but it's important to highlight that there's a wide body of anecdotal experiences of these substances on the internet. And these reports are common knowledge or valid knowledge, and they're valid in scientific communities as well. However, investments need to be made on analyzing these trip reports for other researchers to take it more seriously. So what are the clinical implications? What is this, the point of this talk? So PCP and its analogs have effects that should be investigated in the context of psychotherapy. PCP and PCP analogs are akin to more stimulating versions of ketamine, which may help facilitate talk therapy or psychotherapy. It's a stimulator like MDMA, and like MDMA, PCP and its analogs are stimulating. And I believe that one of the pitfalls of ketamine therapy is the Cahill phenomenon, which may act as a barrier to talk therapy. You can't do therapy if you're unconscious. So the hallmark of PCP, PCP analogs, ketamine analogs, and MDMA is that you could work through trauma while you're under the influence of the drug. And like MDMA, PCP and its analogs are not very visual. PCP induced dissociation is an important aspect of this compound. Inducing dissociation in a controlled psychotherapeutic context may have a therapeutic effect for people with PTSD. And again, similar to MDMA, this allows trauma survivors to face and resolve traumatic issues without being overwhelmed by them. And uh, dissociation is also a common feature in complex PTSD and this substance alongside psychotherapy may be particularly useful for complex PTSD. And so this is a 1980 quote from Dr. Edward F. Domino who coined the term dissociative anesthesia and they passed away in 2021. He worked with ketamine and ketamine derivatives for decades. And the quote reads, I believe the final chapter of PCP is yet to be written. I wholeheartedly agree with Dr. Edward F. Domino, and I thank you all for coming to my psychedelics talk. Looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you.